Hello, New York Giants fans. Welcome back to Everything New York Giants with New York Giants Fangirl. I'm Adriana, your host, and today is a great day. It's another Victory Monday, but it's an even better Victory Monday because it's Black Monday, which means that there were some firings. So we are going to recap the Giants' beautiful, beautiful win over the Philadelphia Eagles. We are going to talk about their draft picks, and then we are also going to talk about the firings. So let's start there because, as to be expected, the Giants made two changes to their coaching staff. So the first one is they fired offensive line coach Bobby Johnson, which is a surprise to absolutely no one um, and a relief to all of us just that it's officially done. So they will be looking for a new offensive line coach which probably is starting today. And then next up, they also fired special teams coordinator Thomas McGahee, who has been with the organization for quite a while. He's made it through multiple different coaches over the last six or seven years, whatever it's been. Um, but something that I think we all saw coming as well. So those were the two firings. There were also two other changes in, um, in the organization. So Let's talk about those. The first one being that running back, running back coach Jeff Nixon is also leaving. So he took a position at Syracuse to be their offensive coordinator and him and Dable go way back. And Dable said in the press conference with Joe Shane today that um, him and Jeff go way back. They love each other. And Jeff's goal has always been to be a college football coach and that this was his stepping stone to getting there. And Dable said that he's okay with it. So another position that they need to fill will be the running backs coach. And then something else that I know we are all going to be super thrilled about. You know how much I have talked about this, how much everyone else has talked about this this year, especially with the injuries. The strength and conditioning coach is gone now. He was not fired. Um, his name is Craig Fitzgerald, and he was hired by Florida. So it sounds like he's going to college as well. So we will be getting a new strength and conditioning coach, which God bless. I know we all need it. Um, so two changes they are not making is to the offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator. So both Mike Kafka and Wink are expected to stay. Now, when Dable spoke to the media this morning, he said that his expectation is that they are going to stay, meaning I'm not going to fire them, but if they go somewhere else, that's their decision. Now, Wink has said from day one, he looks at being the defensive coordinator with the Giants as his end goal. He's not looking to move to be a head coach. He's not looking to move organizations, you know, after this. Now, I, we, I, we don't know how much of that is true, right? Is he saying that because that's the right thing to do and that's what he should say? Obviously, you don't want to hear the coordinator say, yeah, no, I'm just going to be here for a year and then I'm going to peace out. Um, so I think we'll never really know, but I do appreciate the fact that he said that he didn't have to say that he could say things like Dable says, like I'm focused on the present. I'm the defensive coordinator this year, this week, and this is what I'm focusing on. I'm not worried about the future, blah, blah, blah. But Wink has always been really honest. And I think it's great that he said that. I love Wink. I think it would be absolutely asinine and stupid for them to fire him. So I am so glad that that's not the decision. Now, Kafka, on the other hand, I'm okay with it because I feel like Dable is going to take over play calling next year. Now, this is all TBD. It's just an assumption that I'm having. Um, I feel like, you know, we all know Dable is an offensive minded coach. He's very involved in the process. That's his thing. So I think it could be very likely that he takes that over next year. But I also feel like, you know, last year when they made the playoffs, Kafka did a great job and was getting head coaching opportunities. And this year when they lost four of their starters who didn't even play, you know, an entire game together, then, you know, obviously things were a lot more difficult. Now I have completely a lot about some of Kafka's calls. I have not agreed with some of them I thought were fine. So I'm glad he's staying from a continuity perspective. I don't, I didn't want to have to start over at offensive coordinator. And I think that the relationship that Dable and Kafka has is good. And I think if Dable takes over play calling, I think we could see a difference in the offensive play next year because of it. So something that we will keep our eyes on again, that has not been discussed um, openly with all of us. I'm sure they've had discussions in the buildings about it, but we will see what happens. So as of right now, that's the plan. I will keep you guys posted if anything changes over the next few days, but there 
so far from what I've seen, there have not been any requests to have Mike Kafka um, interview for some of the head coach positions that are opening up as of today. So again, see if anything changes. But as of right now, that's a deal. So let's continue on with what Joe Shane said uh, when he spoke to the media today. So he um, said that everything we do in the organization is going to be evaluated during this time. The entire process we're going to eval evaluate and they'll be better off for it. He also said that he's excited that they have four picks in the top 70 of the draft this year. So he's excited about that and hopes that that is going to make a big difference. He was asked about the injuries because of course he was asked about the injuries. One thing that I thought that was interesting that he has not really said before when asked about the injuries, it seems like this might be part of a new process with them, is that they're going to do deep dives and more investigation into injury history. Now I think they have done that before, but I think they have done it to maybe a minor level, and I think they're going to take it up a notch. Um, and I think that's going to be something big, especially when it comes to the draft. So what my cousin and I were just talking about, because we went to the game together last night, is does that automatically feel like maybe Michael Penix Jr. is not going to be in the running coming off of two ACL injuries? So who knows? All speculation on our part, but I think it might be something to consider when you hear Joe Shane say something like, a player's injury history is extremely important. Yes, it was in the past, but look at the look at this team this year and every year for the last couple of years. Like injuries are obviously a problem. So I don't know. Just a thought. We'll see what happens. But I am glad that it seems like they're really going to be taking previous injuries into account. And I don't know if that means they're automatically going to rule out players because of specific injuries that they had or what. He also said that, you know, last year they had six ACLs. This year they only had two. So the soft tissue injuries got better, which I'm sure was maybe in relation to the turf that they installed at MetLife. Um, but, you know, he obviously did say that they dealt with a lot of injuries this year. So something they're going to get more information on. So we'll see about that. Now, you know, he was asked about Daniel Jones because obviously he was asked about Daniel Jones. He was asked about bringing in a quarterback this offseason, and this was his answer. There's always a chance Daniel Jones is not ready by week one, so we need to hope for the best but plan for all possibilities. He also said that he does still believe in Daniel Jones, which, again, the fact that anyone is shocked by that is literally mind-boggling to me. What also is mind-boggling to me is that some beat reporter asked Daniel Jones to his face this morning, what does he think about them drafting a quarterback? Is that going to affect him and what he's doing. And Jones laughed, which I was like, good for you. You should laugh in their face because it's an idiotic fucking question. The same thing, like, what do you expect Joe Shane to say? Do, do these people honestly think that Shane is going to say, yeah, no, I know we signed Daniel Jones to this big deal, but he's coming off an injury, so we're just going to sit him next year. Like, what? He's, of course, going to have his players back. That's what a good GM does. He's not going to say whatever whatever they really think about Daniel Jones and his injury and his play earlier this year. He's never going to come out and say that to us, the fans and the media. So I don't know why people have different expectations for that, but he's not throwing his players under the bus. He's not previous GMs, you know? So um, I respect him for that. Whether or not you agree with his assessment of Daniel Jones and whether or not he should be the starter is entirely different. But for all we know, it could all be smoke and mirrors. Because if he comes out and says something like, well, we're definitely drafting a quarterback because of Jones's ACL, then the five other picks ahead of us are all going to know, okay, well, the Giants are going for a quarterback. You know what I mean? You don't you don't throw away your hand like that. Joe Shane is smarter than that. So anyway, so um, what else about Joe Shane? So a couple other tweets here. Um, that I think, I feel like that was kind of the most important things that he talked about. You know, they were asked about guys like Saquon and McKinney who are going to be free agents. Are they going to resign them and whatnot? And, you know, he basically just kind of gave a generic answer, like, we're going to talk to all of those players, we're going to go through the process, and we'll make decisions. So we will see. Um, the franchise tag is available. They have the option to franchise him, um, Saquon, or they can franchise McKinney. 
just all depends on numbers. So we'll see what happens. But I will keep you guys updated, of course, on anything that happens about that. So let's move along to the Giants win over the Eagles. They finally did it. And you know what? The best part about it is that they, the Giants, stomped on the Eagles starters. So Sirianni can say whatever he wants about, oh, well, we weren't trying that hard because Dallas was up. Um, you know, by the third quarter and I switched up my starters because, you know, we're saving them for the playoffs. It's bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. They were down 24 nothing when they put Marcus Mariota in with two minutes left in the first half. And what does he do? Throw an interception on his first play. So... The defense did a really good job, obviously. They held the starting players to zero points in the first half. Um, you know, they, after yesterday's game, they are tied with the Ravens, leading defenses with the most amount of turnovers at 31. And this is a defense that went, I think, the first, it might have been six or seven weeks, where they had zero turnovers, that they had forced. So the fact that they went from that to now up to 31 and they lead the league is amazing, which is a huge reason why I have been advocating for Wink to stay. The defense is obviously the best part of this team. It's not even close. So anyway, very excited that Wink is staying. So there was a lot of cute quarterback shuffle yesterday, which I thought was interesting, just dealing with injuries again. Tyrod had a thumb issue after one of his stiff arms. He came back in, but they had put DeVito in while they were waiting for Tyrod to clear. Then DeVito was in the medical tent for some sort of issue that he was having, which I didn't even see. I saw DMs people saying that he was in the tent Um because I couldn't see it on the field, which was crazy. Then, you know, Tyrod goes back out and DeVito comes back in. It was very interesting, to say the least. But Tyrod had a good game. He did well overall. Um, you know, he missed a couple throws. They were so close to getting Shep the touchdown. We need to talk about Shep because there were a lot, a lot of cheers. And unfortunately, there were a lot of Eagles fans there. But every time they showed... Oh, I'm going to get sad. Um, every time they showed him... It was all love, and it was beautiful. Um, he got the three receptions that he needed. He is now, he has replaced Jeremy Shockey, which this is amazing. You know, I saw some stupid fans being like, why are we doing this for Shep? Shep is the longest tenure giant. He has been through, what, four different coaches. He has dealt with a shitty offensive line. He has dealt with not good quarterback play. You know, the last two years of his career, he's barely even played at all, and he's never said anything. He's been a leader. He's worked his ass off to come back from Achilles and ACL tears. He's dealt with really challenging injuries. He's dealt with concussions, and he's just always put the team first. He's such a good dude, and he now is number five in franchise history for the most receptions from a wide receiver, and I think that's incredible, and I think he deserved the standing ovation and the cheers that he got. So we love Shaq. Um, all right. Taylor was 23 for 32, 297 yards, one touchdown, one interception. He was only sacked once. Now, we were going into this game, me specifically, panicking at the fact that John Michael Schmitz was listed. He was listed as questionable, and then they moved him to inactive right before the game. And I was like, oh, my God, this is, oh, my God, <laughs> please, please pray for Tyron. This is not going to be good. Um, but you know what? The line held it together for the most part. The run game was awful, but they did a really good job pass blocking and they just did a good job of protecting Taylor. He was not under pressure a lot of times. And I know a big part of that is because last year the Eagles led the, led, um, the NFL in sacks and this year they're nowhere close to that, but still the Eagles team is very talented. Hassan Reddick is not a joke. And he was listed as questionable, and he did not end up playing. Wait a minute. I don't think he ended up playing. But some of their other defensive linemen are very good. I mean, they did an amazing job of stopping our run. I mean, Saquon had eight, 18 carries for 46 yards. So unfortunately for Saquon, he didn't hit that 84 mark where he would have gotten the 1,000 yards 
rushing this year, but he did have two TDs. Um, he had a beautiful, I mean, Tyrod throws a really nice deep ball and Saquon caught it and ran it in and it was awesome. He did a great job. Um, Tyrod, eight carries for 38 yards. Eric Gray, so they put Eric Gray in towards the end and he did a great job running. Listen, he's not Saquon. He doesn't have the explosiveness that Saquon does. No one is going to say that, oh, if we lose Saquon, Eric Gray is going to be just as good. He's not, but he is a really good north-south runner, and he can break through some tackles. So on three carries yesterday, he had 19 yards, and the longest one was 12. So he's, he's going to be a good backup. I think he's probably going to be what Matt Burita has been to this offense over the last couple of years. So I like Gray. I'm excited to see more of him. Um, and then Sterling had one carry for six yards. So, you know, the defense did a really good job. One thing about Sterling is that on that handoff, that would have been the third reception, but it was a handoff, so it didn't count. And then the Giants ended up giving the ball back to the Eagles, and then the defense comes through with the takeaway. The Giants get the ball back, and Sterling gets his third reception. It was just like, Everyone came to play. Everyone said, I'm so sick of losing to this goddamn team. They probably hate Nick Sirianni as much as we do. And I just have felt really good to get a win. It felt really good to get a win against the Eagles. We absolutely killed their starters. And they are not the team that they used to be. But the fact that week 18, this team has nothing to play for. They're not in the playoffs. Everyone's talking about how they should just tank because they'll get a better draft pick and everyone's only worried about the draft pick and blah, blah, blah. These guys said, no, we came to play. This is a division game. It's our division rival who is beating up on us for the last couple of years. It's our turn to turn the tables and return the favor. And they did and it was glorious, and I love them. Let's talk about the receiving. Wandale, oh my god, guys, if there is one really good highlight coming out of this year, it, it should be none other than Wandale Robinson. I know there are some other ones, but Wandale coming back from that knee injury, and Dable was asked about it in the post game, and he just said, you know, we could tell that Wandale was not himself until all of a sudden he like really hit that 100% mark where he was back to himself and you immediately saw the difference on the field. And, you know, we talked about this coming about from coming back from knee injuries like Shep has done and now like Wando has done, whether it's the Achilles or the ACL, it's no joke. And when you are a skilled player like Wandale, who has to cut a lot, who has to focus on speed, who has to try and juke his way through tackles, it's not easy to do that less than a year off of surgery like that. So the fact that he turned it around and he's been such an amazing player for this offense, I'm so fucking hyped about him for the next couple of years. I feel like he's going to be a guy that we just all are going to love, just love him. Five receptions for 85 yards. Darius Lee in five receptions for 62 yards and a touchdown. He's another guy that we have to talk about who I know we have all beaten down badly, but he has been unbelievable for this team. And I feel like, you know, up until this year, he's gotten a lot of crap for the drops because they've come at really opportune times for the Giants to win games, and he just has not come up with the ball. And we really saw that turnaround this year. He had a couple drops, but none of them were game losers like they were during, I think it was an Eagles game, or, you know, during big games like that where they just had the opportunity to bring it home for the win, and he didn't. So... He's been amazing. He had over 770 yards this season. He had over um, 45 and 50 yards yesterday, so he hit his incentive. So he's a guy that just has has been really a steady part of this offense, and I feel like he deserves some more love, and he's going to be back next year. He signed a two-year deal. I know there's been a lot of concerns about whether or not he's going to be back. He's going to be back. So he's another guy that I think we could be really excited about going into next season. Saquon, two receptions for 51 yards out of two targets, which is big because I know Saquon had some really big drops last week and um, he turned it on this week and went two for two. So we'd love to see that. Waller, out of six targets, had five receptions for 45 yards. Again, someone who has definitely struggled this season. He hasn't gotten the yak yardage that we all were expecting him to get. Dealt with a lot of injuries, unfortunately, especially this year, but 
Um, you know, five receptions for 45 yards. Like at the end of the day, I just want to see him make plays. And I think that next year is going to be even better for him. I think next year is going to be better for a lot of players on this team because this year was a shit show. But you know what I mean? I just think he's a guy that we can all look forward to. And I know a lot of fans are really bummed out by his lack of production this year and the injuries and everything. But at the end of the day, He's better than Kadarius Tony, And that's all anyone should think about when they say, oh, Darren Waller was a waste. Would you rather have Kadarius Tony? The answer to that is no. It's, it's no. There is no other answer, okay? Moving on. Isaiah Hodgins, three targets, three receptions for 36 yards. Another guy who has been very reliable. Um, I'm actually not so sure about what his contract details look like. I think he signed a two-year deal last year, so I don't think he's going to be here next year. Who knows? Maybe they will re-sign him with Shep gone. Um, but, but we'll see. So um, I, I always liked Hodgins. He's a playmaker. He's done a great job for us. So love him. Um, so Shepard had five targets, three receptions for 18 yards. He did it. They tried so hard to get him the touchdown, guys. I just, we were all on our feet screaming, rooting for him. It was such a good game to be at. And I just was like, I was so happy for him. So such a good dude. Um, Eric Gray had one, re one reception at a one target for nine yards. And then Jalen Hyatt, two targets, one reception for five yards. He left with a hamstring injury. Now, I believe Art Stapleton was the one. I'm sorry if it wasn't him, but someone, one of the beat writers, one of the trusted beat writers, let me be clear about that, said that, um, I believe it was Dable who said that Hyatt came up to him and said his hamstring was tightening up, so it was more precautionary than anything. I don't know if he, it sounds like he didn't really re-injure anything. Uh, it just kind of got tight on him and he didn't want to risk it. So Hyatt's a guy to, to be excited about next year. I'm not worried about him the slightest. I think it's going to be fine. All right, let's talk about defense. Um, so Tyrod had the one fumble, um, but it was a botched snap. We recovered it, so that was fine. Um, oh, maybe Saquon must have recovered it. I thought it was Tyrod, but anyway. No turnover. Well, there was the one interception on offense, but outside of that, they did a good job of protecting the ball. And Tyrod threw the ball behind Shep in the end zone. It would have been a touchdown. It went off his hands, and Blankenship caught it. But outside of that, McFadden recovered a fumble. Aziz recovered a fumble. And then McKinney had two interceptions. Micah McFadden, nine total tackles, seven solo. Um, McFadden is definitely getting better. He's a guy that I'm excited about next year. Something I really want to see this defensive um, coaching staff do. They need to do more tackling drills this offseason. It needs to be a priority, and I'm talking about for everyone. I'm not, there are a lot of guys that I'm not worried about, like Bobby Okurike and McKinney and whatever, and like Adoree's not going to be here next year, but like the tackling thing, it's got to improve. Belton lost a couple, um, McFadden lost a couple. I mean, we've seen it with various guys, McKinney even earlier in the season, so something I really want to see improved upon this offseason. So, we had five sacks and five tackles for loss. This defense came to play. They said, we are done. We are done with this narrative that we are not good and we can't beat the Eagles. And oh my God, I just, oh, I loved it. Bobby Okurike, eight total tackles, five solo, one sack, one tackle for loss. And listen, I'm really happy he had that sack. And obviously, thank God the Giants won because all everyone would have been talking about today was the encroachment where he jumped over the thing, which honestly, I was like, I was annoyed by it because it was a third down, but I was like, they're going to get the tush push anyway. If we ever stopped a tush push, has anyone ever stopped the Eagles with a tush push? No. So I was like, I wasn't even that mad about it, but I am glad that he recovered and made up for it with the sack and the Giants ended up winning because, you know, that would have been ugly. Um, Dane Belton, six total tackles, six solo, one sack, two totals, two tackles for loss. Great game for Belton. He missed a tackle or two overall. Great game for him. Um, McKinney and Trey Hawkins both had six tackles. Um, Hawkins struggled a bit towards the end. He came in when Nick McLeod left with an injury, um, but I think he's he's overall 
he's going to be fine. Um, he's another guy I want to see the tackling improve this offseason, but he's a rookie. He didn't have the high expectations like someone like Tay Banks had, but um, I'm excited about him. I think he's going to be a good option over the next couple of years. Aziz, Aziz, who we've all talked about, has had a tough time. Four tackles, four solo, two sacks, one tackle for loss in the fumble recovery. Aziz, this is what I like to see. I like to see. I Obviously, guys dealing with injuries is frustrating, but I can forgive them for the injury issues if when they're on the field, they make plays. I don't care if it's Darren Waller. I don't care if it's Aziz Ojolari. I don't care who it is. But if when you're on the field and you make plays, we will all forgive you for the injury stuff because most likely it's not your fault. It's the medical staff. So it is what it is. Um, Ashawn Robinson, a guy that they have to re-sign this offseason. Two tackles, one tackle for loss. Hottie had the last sack, and he also hit that incentive. I believe he needed either a half a sack or a sack to get it, and he did. Um, just the defense was fun to watch yesterday, man. They stopped some big plays. They did a good job of stopping the run for the most part. Um, really good pass deflections from quite a few players, and obviously the turnovers. Just... They were fun to watch. It was great. Uh, last up, special teams. Okay. Gunner, Gunner is another guy who absolutely has to be re-signed. There should be no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I think that that was one of the better free agent pickups this off season, or this current season. Um, and I think there's no question that he's going to be re-signed. Three um, punt returns for 29 yards. The longest was 15. Mason Crosby, two for three on the field goal. <sighs> So from what I saw up in the stands, it looked like someone got a handoff on it because I felt like it never had the right trajectory that it was supposed to have and it wasn't super windy. I, maybe he didn't and I don't know what happened, uh, but it hit it hit the sidebar and I was just like, oh my God. We could have we could have finally had 30 points since the Cardinals game and it, it, it would have been nice, you know, to just hit that threshold, but uh there's always next year. Um, outside of that, the good news, he was three for three on the extra point. The extra good news is that we are going to have Graham Goodo back next year. So that's the best part. Jamie Gillen, last up, five um, total kicks. Four were inside of the 20. I feel like this might need to be talked about a little bit more. This might have been his best game. Four out of five punts in the inside the 20? Jamie Gillen. He's going to be here next year. He also signed a multi-year deal, him and Graham Gano, so they will be back. So T-Mac will not be. So we'll see about the special teams coordinator. We'll see about um, the offensive line coach. And as always, I will keep you guys updated. So um, next week, I'll be back with another podcast going to do a recap of the whole season and talk about the guys that are going to be free agents and the ones that I want the Giants to re-sign. Then I'll probably take a week or two off, and then it's going to be all draft talk all the time. Uh, with a little bit of free agency sprinkled in there when it kicks off March 15th. So thank you guys for listening. Subscribe to my YouTube. Subscribe to podcasts wherever you listen. It's available on all of them. Again, called Everything New York Giants. And you can follow me on Instagram at New York Giants Fangirl. Also on TikTok and Twitter. I just hit 10,000 followers on Instagram. Thank you guys so much for the love. I appreciate all of your support. And I'm so excited. This offseason is going to be fun, okay? We have four picks in the top 70. We are going to have some money to spend that Joe Shane is finally going to be able to have in free agency. So we got some good stuff to look forward to. So go Giants. I'll see you guys next week.